Welcome. Today we would like to discuss the importance of suspecting sepsis in every patient you treat so more survive. The incidence of sepsis is startling. Every two minutes in the United States, someone dies of sepsis, and globally, we lose someone every four seconds. With prevention and timely sepsis identification and treatment, we can greatly reduce the incidence of sepsis and save lives and reduce suffering. In the hospital setting, sepsis is the leading cause of death and contributes to one in every two to three deaths. Of these deaths, the majority of patients presented to the hospital with sepsis. Sepsis accounts for 258,000 deaths a year in the U.S. This is greater than the number of deaths from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. Many times there is a disconnect in identifying sepsis. This is due to common sepsis myths. Many believe sepsis only affects the elderly and patients with significant comorbidities. In addition, many individuals believe it won't happen to them or their family members. This couldn't be further from the truth. Sepsis can affect anyone at any time. However, some groups are at higher risk for developing sepsis, the young, the old, and those with chronic illnesses. We will be introducing you to some individuals whose lives have been forever changed by sepsis. Meet Dr. Carl Flatley, a retired endodontist from Florida. His daughter, Erin, was a healthy 23-year-old. In 2002, my daughter came home from college. She was going to graduate school and went in for a simple outpatient surgery. She had that done on Wednesday. Sunday night, we took her back to the hospital, and on Tuesday, she was dead from something I'd never heard of. I was with her when she died, and she looked at me, and her eyes said, can't you do something, Dad? I mean, she was scared. And she was gone just like that. Sepsis is an overreaction of the body to infection, and it can cause death or disabilities. When Carl lost Aaron, he looked around for an organization to help put his resources into. He found there was no organization at that time that was doing any work around sepsis advocacy. So Carl Flatley did what Carl Flatley does. He said, well, heck, I'm going to have to do it myself. There became a determination that I saw in Carl's eyes that I've never seen before to find out answers to questions that we didn't know and to make sure that no other parent experienced the loss of a child from sepsis as he had had to endure. Sepsis kills more people than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS put together. 12 children every day die of sepsis, and that's more than cancer. So we have a huge awareness challenge in front of us to get that word out. The goal of sepsis science is public awareness because if a patient does not recognize the early symptoms, then a lot of times not get to the hospital on time to get the appropriate treatment. When I joined Sepsis Alliance in 2007, fewer than 20% of the U.S. population had heard of sepsis before. We still have a lot of work to do, but before Carl got started, 19%, and now we're at more than 50%. Without Carl, we wouldn't have protocols to manage sepsis in almost every hospital in the country. Without Carl, children would be dying more frequently than they are today. He single-handedly has changed the way we think about sepsis in America. The success of Sepsis Alliance to spread awareness and save the lives of others would verify what Aaron said. Can't you do something, Dad? This would in fact verify that I did something. She'd really be happy. Meet Zach. At the age of 11, Zach developed sepsis from MRSA. What is particularly interesting about Zach's experience is that Zach's mother is a family physician. Since her son was a healthy, vibrant boy, it never occurred to her that Zach could have sepsis. It was a regular Wednesday. We met Zach at the game. And after the game, he started to cry. And the first thing he said was, my knee hurts, I have a headache, and I'm dizzy. Over the course of the next four days, he became more and more ill. And on Saturday evening, we took him to the emergency room. They immediately started IV antibiotics. And finally, by that evening, we were told that he needed to be put into a medically induced coma to be put on a respirator. And at that point, the diagnosis of sepsis was confirmed. He stayed that way for 12 days and had multiple complications. I kept thinking, am I gonna be a mom who loses a child? 
It can happen to your parent, it can happen to your spouse, it can happen to you. So you need to know what it is and what to look for. Today, Zach is happy and healthy, but there are some lingering effects from his experience with sepsis, and his mother was left with a feeling of disbelief that she didn't pick up on it. Meet Lisa. Lisa's husband, Jeff, suddenly became ill at work and sought medical treatment at a local emergency department. Sepsis was not recognized during the initial evaluation. The first doctor who saw him said Jeff had the flu, a common pronouncement when people present with sepsis symptoms. Jeff was still in the emergency department, though, because he hadn't been discharged yet. He continued to decline, becoming hypotensive and complaining of having the worst pain ever. Sepsis was finally identified when Jeff was in septic shock. He died hours later. He was only 40 years old. Sepsis can be challenging to identify. Many times, patients present to the hospital with subtle symptoms. This may delay arrival to the emergency department, recognition in triage, or recognition during hospital admission. Many times, symptoms of sepsis mimic less severe conditions. With sepsis, often the patient's condition escalates rapidly. No one department owns sepsis. Some communities have limited sepsis identification and management resources in their healthcare facilities. To increase awareness of sepsis and when to seek help, Sepsis Alliance has developed a sepsis mnemonic and several resources. One example is symptoms of sepsis. S. Shivering, fever, or very cold. E. Extreme pain or general discomfort, worst ever. P. Pale or discolored skin. S. Sleepy, difficult to rouse, confused. I. I feel like I might die. S. Short of breath. Children are not small adults, and their sepsis symptoms differ from adults. Because of this, Sepsis Alliance created references for recognizing sepsis in a child. One or more of the following symptoms may indicate a critical illness. Any child who feels abnormally cold to touch, looks mottled, bluish, or has very pale skin, has a rash that does not fade when you press on it, is breathing very fast, has a convulsion, is very lethargic or difficult to wake up, a child under five who is not eating, is vomiting repeatedly, has not urinated in 12 hours. What is sepsis? It all starts with a source of infection, any infection. Sepsis is the body's overwhelming and life-threatening response to infection, which can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. Sepsis can be caused by any type of infection, bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic. Recognition of sepsis is key to early intervention. Two methods are available to assist in recognition, SIRS criteria and SOFA criteria. A modified version of SOFA is called QSOFA. SIRS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. This syndrome may occur as the body responds to infection or injury. It is important to remember non-infectious disorders may also cause SIRS. Once a patient has a source of infection, we need to evaluate further to determine if there is a systemic inflammatory response happening. Does the patient have any two of the following criteria plus infection? Temperature greater than 38.3 degrees Celsius, 101 degrees Fahrenheit, or less than 36 degrees Celsius, 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Heart rate faster than 90 beats per minute. Respiratory rate faster than 20 breaths per minute white blood cell count higher than 12,000 or lower than 4,000, bands 10% or higher. If so, the patient has sepsis. It is important to remember some patients are on medications or have underlying conditions that limit the ability to respond. An example is certain heart medications limit or decrease the ability for increased heart rate. SOFA is the acronym for Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. A higher score is associated with increased incidence of mortality. A change in baseline of the total score by two points or more represents organ dysfunction. This tool is complex and requires laboratory values as part of the criteria. The Sepsis Definition Task Force developed a modified version of the SOFA that maintains high reliability in predicting severity of illness. This is called the QSOFA. The score ranges from 0 to 3. It can be assessed immediately upon presentation and does not require laboratory values. Patients with suspected infection who are likely to have a prolonged ICU stay or to die in the hospital can be promptly identified at the bedside with QSOFA. 
a score of QSOFA of two or higher is predictive of increased mortality. Sepsis is the presence of infection, suspected or confirmed, with a systemic response to infection. Sepsis escalates to septic shock when there is persistent hypotension despite fluid resuscitation and or tissue hypoperfusion, which is seen by an elevated lactate level. The latest sepsis guidelines has removed the term severe sepsis and categorized that into septic shock. What exactly happens to a patient as they escalate from sepsis to septic shock? It begins with an organism that results in an infection. The body develops a systemic inflammatory response, which causes diffuse endothelial disruption and microcirculation defects. This results in global tissue hypoxia and organ dysfunction. When multiple organ dysfunction and refractory hypotension occurs, it is called septic shock. The greatest unknown is the number of sepsis survivors. Many sepsis survivors live with disabilities for the rest of their lives. These consist of, but are not limited to the obvious, such as amputations, to the less obvious, such as problems with memory, thinking, and calculations. Many suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and they live in fear of becoming ill once again. Worse, many feel as if they are all alone. They feel that no one understands what they've gone through. They're often told that they're lucky, they survived. It has also been reported that many caregivers also experience cognitive, emotional, and financial challenges. How do we provide the highest quality of care for our patient? Once sepsis is suspected, early initiation of therapy is of essence. The sepsis bundles have been developed to streamline and standardize evidence-based practice. The three-hour bundle is to be completed within three hours of time of presentation. Measure lactate level. Obtain blood cultures prior to administration of antibiotics. Administer broad-spectrum antibiotics. Administer 30 milliliters per kilogram crystalloid for hypotension or lactate that is 4 millimoles per liter or higher. Early recognition and treatment of sepsis may prevent development of septic shock. The sepsis bundles use lactate as an indicator of tissue perfusion. The body's energy needs are mainly met by aerobic metabolism, which requires oxygen. If there is a lack of oxygen in the body, it reverts to anaerobic metabolism, of which lactic acid is a byproduct. This may, in turn, lead to lactic acidosis or a decreased physiological pH. This is an emergency and requires immediate medical attention. Elevated lactate levels tell you that there are tissue beds in your body that are having to function without oxygen. As perfusion is improved, lactate levels usually decrease. The six-hour bundle has the following elements. Apply vasopressors for hypotension that does not respond to initial fluid resuscitation to maintain a mean arterial pressure, MAP, of 65 millimeters of mercury or higher. In the event of persistent hypotension after initial fluid administration, MAP of less than 65 millimeters of mercury, or if initial lactate was 4 millimoles per liter or higher, reassess volume status and tissue perfusion and document findings. Remeasure lactate if initial lactate is elevated. Reassessment and documentation are critical for evaluation and communication of the response to interventions. The required reassessment of volume status and tissue perfusion includes either repeat focused exam after initial fluid resuscitation by licensed independent practitioner including vital signs, cardiopulmonary assessment, capillary refill, pulse, and skin findings, or two of the following, measure CVP, Measure SCVO2, bedside cardiovascular ultrasound, dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness with passive leg raise or fluid challenge. In addition to blood cultures and lactate, there are a variety of lab tests to assist us in evaluating a patient that we suspect has sepsis. Procalcitonin is a prohormone of calcitonin. It is secreted by many cell types and organs after bacterial pro-inflammatory stimulation. Elevated procalcitonin levels indicate bacterial infection, accompanied by a systemic inflammatory reaction. Localized infection generally does not increase circulating procalcitonin. Slightly elevated levels are associated with a mild systemic inflammatory response to bacterial infection. Very elevated PCT levels are associated with acute disease with severe systemic reaction, such as severe sepsis and septic shock. Procalcitonin is a useful tool for optimization, treatment duration, and de-escalation of antibiotic therapy in a bacterial infection. 
It increases early, three to six hours after an infectious challenge, and has a highly specific rise in response to severe systemic bacterial infections. Levels are usually low in viral infections, chronic inflammatory, and autoimmune disorders. Procalcitonin levels in sepsis are usually more than 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter, may reach levels of 10 to 100 nanograms per milliliter or more. C-reactive protein is an additional inflammatory marker available for sepsis screening. A rise in the plasma concentration of C-reactive protein in the absence of other non-infectious causes of inflammation, examples trauma, surgery, etc., may be suggestive of infection. While this test is useful, there are limitations. Severe liver disease may reduce the amount of C-reactive protein elevation. Sepsis may be present despite a normal value. Nurses are the key to suspecting sepsis. Suspect sepsis, save lives. Advocate for every patient. As nurses, we commit to bringing the right care to the right patient at the right time so more survive. Sepsis Alliance is the nation's leading not-for-profit organization focused on saving lives and reducing suffering by raising awareness of sepsis as a medical emergency. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to learn more about sepsis. For more information and to get involved with Sepsis Alliance, you can visit us at sepsis.org. My mother, a 20-year breast cancer survivor, she dies of a disease that we never even, never even heard of. Septic shock, sepsis, and she was like, how do you spell it? I said, I don't know. Really, does it affect that many people? Then why haven't I heard of it? My mother, Mama, she had plans of being a gospel singer. They found a clot in her femoral artery she got through that surgery, but she started complaining of a lot of weakness, couldn't catch her breath. When I heard the word sepsis, I didn't understand it. I remember that I went to bed, woke up to find the EMTs in my room. My doctor friend called the hospital and said, look, unless somebody's coding, there's no one in there as sick as this man is right now. Get a doctor in there. In the next few hours, I had one shut down after another all of my organs, lungs, kidneys, eventually a heart attack. My toes were blackened and gangrenous. It was very unclear as to whether I would survive. It was Halloween. He was up crying and crying. I took his temperature, 102.3, and his color was gray. His lips, his everything was gray, and he was not responding. We got to the hospital. Um, he got swelled up, so he was huge. And one of the doctors said, we don't know if you'll be able to take him home. I'd been waiting for him for, for all these months and I've only had him three weeks. He, he's mine. I wish I would have asked more, but I felt like I was supposed to know as a mother I didn't understand that any infection could result in a toxic response that is known as sepsis. It started when I went to the dentist and had some dental work. Following that, I developed an infection. And then, septic shock. I can't even describe to you the horror of seeing her die of sepsis. The body swelling up twice its size, fingers turning black, having to be intubated. It looked like someone took a shotgun and shot her in the leg. That's what it looked like. For me, this could have a very different ending. And it's why I share my survivor story. And the nurse, her name was Annie, and she says, are you ready to hold him? And I said, oh my God, yes. Put him in my arms. And she says, he's gonna be okay. I thought maybe if I share my story, you know, somebody will learn from it. Mama's gone, but maybe somebody else 
can be saved.